Welcome to this episode of Haunted Hour Podcast. This time I sat down with Bill Bryan of Empty Casket Paranormal, and we talk about the Ouija board, his collection, and his new traveling museum. We cover everything from who burnt the first Ouija board and why. Does Bill use all his boards and are they evil? Bill has put a lot of time and research into his collection and the Ouija board, so let's get right into the episode. So I'm really excited to have you on today because as we can see in the background, you have a, we, is it Ouija or Ouija board? It's Ouija. Ouija board collection. <laughs> and because my, I had asked my uh, Echo and she said it was like something like Ouija or something like that. I was like, is she talking about the same thing? <laughs> yeah. So there, there's, other people there's, pronounce it like that? Yeah. There's been some uh, debate as to the proper way to pronounce it. However, advertisements from the 1890s and early 1900s specifically spell out it's pronounced Ouija. Okay. So now we know for sure. And I was going to mm -hmm. ask you that. So when did the Ouija board like first make an appearance? So that's kind of a loaded question because there's two answers. If you're if you're looking for the, the Ouija board, as in that brand, uh, that was created in 1890. <clears throat> the patent, so it was named in 1890. The patent was was given in uh, 1891, uh, and and they started selling in 1891. However, talking boards, the the more generic term, that can be dated as far back as 1886. Uh, there was oh. a, a newspaper article. It it was both in the New York uh, Daily Tribune and the Atchison uh, Daily Tribune in 1886. And both were talking about the same phenomenon in, in middle Ohio, in which they were they had what is essentially what we know of as a Ouija board. Uh, it was a little different, but essentially the same thing. And it was kind of taking taking the area over by storm. Uh, it's also that article is also the first instance of anyone talking about burning a Ouija board. Oh, yeah, really? It, what it boiled down to was this one family. Uh, the, the mother and the kids loved playing with the thing to the point where they were neglecting chores and the father didn't like that. So he was leaving on business. And before he left, he burnt the board so they can start doing their chores again. <laughs> he came home to find out that they made a new one. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> wow. I never heard that story before. That's really cool. Yeah. So I never heard it either until of... I found that ar that article. Really? Huh. So that leads me to ask you, what got you started on collecting them in the first place? Uh, so for a very long time, I was very anti Ouija board. Um, didn't want anything to do with them. Had the, the same notion that a lot of other people have that it's evil and all this other nonsense. Uh, as I got more involved in the paranormal and I realized that using a Ouija board, is it's just a tool. It's no different than using pendulums or dowsing rods or... DR60s or REM pods or anything else that we use to communicate with the deceased, yeah. uh, I, I became uh, less problematic with it. Uh, it. But it wasn't until Tanya and I took a trip to Salem and we went to the Ouija board museum that after being in there for like an hour and a half, as we're walking out, I saw that they had a bunch of old Ouija boards for sale. And so oh. I bought my first Ouija board from the Salem Witch Board Museum. And it was oh, a wow. 1960s Ouija board. Oh my gosh. Oh, what a cool find. Okay. So mm -hmm. then that was a question I had also is that, so now you're collecting them. Do yep. you find them in thrift stores or eBay? Do people send them to you? How do you get them? Uh, so we, we've picked up a few at the flea markets and yard sales. Uh, the vast majority have come through uh, eBay and other auction sites. Uh, but I have had a few sent to me. Yeah, one so in particular, that, which I have in okay. glass over here. You probably can't see it, um, uh -huh. but it's uh, supposedly haunted. So I keep okay. that one in glass so that when we have visitors come to the museum, they're not all touching it and, you know, being a pain with it. <laughs> 
so then that leads me to the question of since somebody sent it to you because it was haunted, did they do that because they were afraid of it and they wanted to get rid of it and have you deal with it? Or was there another reason? So the, the story that he told was that, uh, you know, they went and used it a bunch of times and they had some not so friendly things come through. He claims that the, that the uh, Zozo demon came through it and that the last time he used it was three years before he sent it to me. And what happened was um, things started falling off the shelves as they were using it. Uh, lights kept turning on and off and all this. So him and his friend closed on the session, put the Ouija board away, and it went into his closet where it stayed because he didn't want to touch it until his fiance moved in and said, nope, that's got to go. And so he started looking for somewhere that he can get rid of it. Ah. So then have you, as you get these different Ouija boards, I don't know how often you use them, if you use them at all, but do you do. test each one out? Uh, it's my intention to eventually test all of the ones that I have, but I have almost 60 of them. <laughs> oh. And uh, yeah, I just haven't gotten around to testing most of them. So has anything, because I myself have never used a Ouija board. I don't know why. It just hasn't come up yet, and I'm a little bit sketchy about, which is funny because, as you know me, I I do paranormal investigations. Mm -hmm. I've done pretty much everything else, so I, that's just the one thing I haven't done. I haven't found one yet at a thrift store. Maybe that would change my mind. But as you've gone through your whole experience with collecting them or using them, has anything weird happened to you? Nothing. Nothing. Not a single thing. Do you feel nope. like you've had any communication? I've definitely had communication using them. Um, we've used them on some investigations. We've used them with some friends. I've even done it by myself a few times. And you, you definitely get things to happen. Um, but as far as the boards by themselves, like my living room's, well, up until I started setting all this up, my living room was completely covered in Ouija boards. Like every wall is covered in Ouija boards. And there's nothing feels weird. N nothing weird happens so yeah no, i mean the, i don't think the boards themselves can necessarily be haunted um you know things could come through maybe something happens while you're using it but to, to say that the board itself is haunted is not that it's not possible but it's unlikely Okay, because I was going to ask you that, like, so there's a lot of claims that there's like the Zozo that's attached to, and I didn't know if it was particular ones or all of the boards in general. Um, that seems to be the thing that people always think it's something demonic coming through, and I didn't well, know where that came from. <laughs> that's actually one of the reasons that we wanted to start the museum is to, to, if you go online, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so we wanted to, you know, take the time to, to do the digging, find the, the truth, and then be able to give that to people. You know, Zozo is a prime example of it. Zozo, there's not a single report of Zozo ever before March 24th of 2009. That's when Daryl Evans posted his story on, on a forum. That's it. Okay. N nothing before that. Now, if you Google Zozo, you'll find that it's an ancient Mesopotamian uh, demon uh, that there's these old books on devils that it appears in. Nope. Oh. Uh, the, the Mesopotamian deity that they, they're talking about is Pozozo, which was a very benevolent deity, but Pozozo is not Zozo. It, it, it's, it's spelt very differently. It's pronounced differently. I'm not even pronouncing it right. I'm pretty sure. Um, but th they're trying to make a connection where there is, isn't one. And then there's, you know, again, if you Google it, they'll say that the Dictionnaire Infernal, which is an 1816 book on devils, talks about Zozo. So I went out and I bought that book. It doesn't mention Zozo anywhere in the entire oh. book. Huh. I went through it cover to cover. There's no mention of, of Zozo or anything like it. There's there's oh. nothing bef before Daryl Evans made his claims. And, and a lot of the lore and, and stories come from Daryl Evans. So hmm. I, I'm not saying that he's lying, but it's it's likely that he made up the story. Right. Just to get. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't know for sure. You know, maybe something happened and he read too much into it. Maybe he's making it up entirely. I, I don't know. But yeah. as far as as factual evidence that I've been able to dig up there, there's nothing that says that Sozo is a real thing. 
other than hmm. Daryl Evans. Right. For probably, which led to a TV show, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I've seen that quite a few different people who have started off and I've seen them before they were known and they started off with like a little story, which I find really interesting because <laughs> mm -hmm. people really don't do their research about stuff. So I love that you're like doing all this research. So you're taking the, the boards out as a traveling, you're not a traveling museum. You had another way of saying it. Well, so, so we're going to be a traveling museum for now. Um, we would love to eventually have a, a, a physical place that we could set up permanently. Um, yeah. But we're not really sure where we want to do that yet. So part of the traveling is not only to raise funds, but also to kind of gauge interest and, and see where this would be most well received. Yeah. So we, so we have, you know, as of recording this next Saturday, February 3rd, we'll be at the Scranton Cultural Center in Scranton, PA. Uh, and then in uh, the beginning of March, we'll be doing a event at a Moss in Milton, Pennsylvania. That's a metaphysical store. Uh, we're going to be doing a, an event in April at the 1912 Hoover House. Uh, and then we're in talks with a handful of other places that we can go and do events. Uh, we just don't have dates nailed down yet. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And as you get dates, I'll add them to the show notes of, so people can find them in the future or your website so they can find it. Because you have a whole website for we the Ouija Board Museum, right? Yep. ectalkingboardmuseum.com. Yep. Nice. Yep. And we have a, a virtual muse museum up there, which is basically pictures of all of our boards. I have a handful that I, I need to to add boards that I just got last week. I still need to take pictures and add those up. Um, but there are about 53 or 54 boards up there currently, along with um, descriptions. Some of them, there's, there's not much to say about the board. So it's just who made it, when it's from others. There's big stories along with that particular board. Uh, we also have the a timeline, uh, the the history of the, the Ouija board itself from that 1886 article all the way up through to the present day. And uh, we're we're working on adding a uh, myth and superstition section in which we can go through all the various myths and so-called rules of using the the Ouija board that really just stem from um, ignorance and fear. Yeah. So then do you think that, you know, closing out sessions is necessary? Because I was thinking about like when we do ghost box sessions and different things like that, not everybody, including myself, like is like technically closing out the session. So is that important, do you think? I don't think it's that important. And I also don't think it's as hard as people make it out to be. I mean, closing out a session is as simple as saying, you know, thank you spirits for talking to us. Have a good night or say goodbye or anything like, like okay. that. You're closing that door of communication. That's that's all it really needs to be. Um, you know, a lot of people will tell you that all oh, you have to move the planchette over to the word goodbye, and well, not really. That goodbye on the board is for the spirits to use to talk to you, not for you to talk to the spirits. Uh -huh. So just just yeah. saying goodbye is really all you need to do to close it out. Right. Okay. I love that. So, what is your favorite board that you have? Well. <laughs> Again, that's a twofold question because I have a favorite board in terms of just in general boards that I, that have a lot of meaning to it, and then I have another favorite board which is just my favorite design, uh, and both are behind me. Uh, this board right here, uh, that's that's my favorite design one. It's a very 1950s kind of style with oh. with uh, animated pinup girls on it, and whatnot. It was it's a brand new board. It was just designed and made oh. last year, uh, oh, cool. but it's it's just a a beautiful board. And then my other one, uh, you're not going to be able to see it on camera, but back here, uh, over here somewhere, there is a board from 1900. And that's my oh. oldest board. And, and that one kind of means a lot that I've been able to, to pick up that one. Yeah. And now the older boards were like real wood and carved versus like the newer ones are just so, basically paperboard. <laughs> so, yeah. So the, the boards were originally um, wood, usually a, a type of plywood would be... Um, a, a pine core with typically a maple veneer on the front and back and then the uh, everything was printed printed or painted onto them uh in 19 or around 1937 1938 they started going to hardboard which is uh compressed 
sawdust and glue. Um, and they did that up until the mid 1970s, at which point they switched over to cardboard with paper on it. <laughs> now, are all the planchettes always the same? Do you have to have a certain planchette or can people like kind of be artistic about their planchettes? Oh, you could absolutely be artistic about it. I, I have, I, I don't feature the planchettes in the museum currently. They're not on the website currently. Uh, it's something I'll add eventually. But yeah, every planchette's a little bit different. Uh, the the older Ouija boards don't have a hole in the middle. They're just the point, the pointy bit. Um, I have some planchettes that are oval with a hole in it. I got a planchette that's coffin shaped. Um, there's different sizes, different shapes. Yeah, it, it's the, okay. that's just a, a tool to help point you. So there's no standard mm -mm. design. Nope. <laughs> I mean, there's there's your your more more common design, which is that that heart shaped, uh, your typical Ouija board uh, planchette. That's the most common, but it's certainly not the only design out there. Yeah, I always thought that it had like a little um, like a glass in the center. So the the original Ouija boards uh, did not have that. It, it was just a solid um, heart shaped piece of wood with uh, a couple legs on it. Uh, then they went and they added the hole in the middle with glass and they would actually put a little brass pin in the center of the glass to show you exactly okay. where the midpoint was. Uh, and then when they started switching over to plastic and then it just became a clear piece of plastic in it. Okay. So then and, I think that would be the one board I would love is the one with the actual glass in it. To me, I feel like that would have, if you want to like believe that you're speaking to spirits or pulling them in somehow, I feel like having real wood, real metals and glass, I feel like that would give them more. I agree. To, I agree know. entirely. Like, so I, there's a handful of boards that I make and, and, and sell and all of them are, are real wood. The planchettes are made out of wood. Um, I don't have the glass in them. Uh, I, I just keep the a hole in it. That's, that's open. Uh, the main reason I do that is glass can get scratched. It can get foggy. It can get, um, and, and, but sure. if it's just a whole hole, you're never going to have that issue, but, yeah. uh, but yeah, I, yeah. I, I'd much prefer using real wood. Uh, there's only been a couple times that I've used a Ouija board that was made out of cardboard. And yeah. I don't, I don't, it, they're a little bit, they're cheaper. They're, they tend to be smaller. Uh, I just, I just don't like them. I mean, I have tons of them because they're part of the museum, but right, uh, yeah. But in terms of like personal use, I much prefer a wooden one. I agree, and I have your uh, spirit communicator board mm -hmm. that you made, um, and so like I, that one has like a slider that goes back and forth. So yep, technically, how do you? Because I have yet to use. I mean, I've touched <laughs> it and everything, but I haven't actually tried using it. So if I was going to use it, like. How would I start my session? How do I like kind of use the planchette? S same as, as you would use a Ouija board for the most part. Um, if you're using it with other people, uh, the, the planchette, I, I would recommend only having two people touch that, uh, but everyone else can touch the board. So they're still giving their energy to it. They're just not touching the planchette. Um, and then that'll just move side to side with the, the brass pointer pointing towards uh, the different letters and, and numbers. Um, yeah, that spirit communicator is kind of interesting. So that came about around 1900 as a competitor to the Ouija board. So the the uh, William Fold, who was uh, kind of, he didn't own the rights to the, to the Ouija board. He wasn't part of the company. He was he owned the manufacturing company that built it. Um, but because he was leased the rights to manufacture it, uh, he was very litigious. And anyone who made anything even remotely close to the patent, uh, he would go after with lawsuits. And because their company was a lot bigger, a lot of times they would win only because the other company kind of bowed out. So yeah. a lot of people, if they wanted to compete against the Ouija board, had to come up with a completely new design. So that's where this spirit communicator kind of came from. It was some one guy's idea of, of a different way to do it. And there was a, a few others, um, ones that kind of pivoted, uh, a few that uh, were electronic and actually had magnets and whatnot within it. Um, almost none of those still exist today. And huh. those that do exist are very, very expensive and held by real museums that don't want to get rid oh, of it. Wow. 
uh, but a lot of the patents still exist for them. So I have a list of things to do, things that I want to make for the museum. And a lot of these um, alternate types of talking boards are on that list of making different uh, prototypes of them. Oh, that's really exciting. I love that idea too. Of like, I didn't even realize they had invented the electronic ones and stuff like that. I could see that being a thing <laughs> that people mm -hmm. would enjoy, you know, but then that kind of takes away the element of, is it the spirits? But then I could say that about a ghost box or anything else or oh, a yeah. REM pod. So well, yeah. e even using the Ouija board, you know, th there's always a question of, is this really the spirits doing it? Like when I use one by myself, I I'm yeah. constantly questioning is is it spelling out what I want it to spell out or is it, you know, and I'm just subconsciously moving it or is this actual spirits coming through and telling me? And I, I don't know for sure. It, Have you ever thought about just recording it and then like closing your eyes and asking your questions and then going back and reviewing the footage to see what you spelled? That could be nothing, but it could be something. Yes. I have thought about that. I have not done that yet, but it's that thought that has led me to an experiment that I'm going to try doing later in the year. Um, I'm going to make a Ouija board with the letters randomized over the board. No one's going to see the board until we sit down to do this, do the uh, experiment. We're going to have two people using the board. They will be blindfolded and have yeah. headphones in much like the way we do the Estes method. And then everyone right. else will be asking questions and keeping track of where the planchette goes. And this way, it takes away any chance of them um, trying to spell things out because they want to know what the right or want certain answers in there. They're not going to know where the letters are. They're not going to be able to see. They're not going to be able to even know what the questions are. They're just a conduit. So that'll be a really, really interesting experiment. It it could blow up in my face and nothing happens. Yeah. It, right. And but I mean, that's what happens when you do an experiment. You don't know what the results yeah. are going to be. So it's going to be okay. really interesting and it's something I want to, I'm, I'm starting to kind of get the details of how I want to do it, nail down, get the board designed. It's one of the events later in the year, we're going to do that. And then we're going to try to do it at every event from there forward. Uh, Cause yeah. doing it once, even if nothing happens, that's one data right. point. You really need yeah. a lot of data points to, to be able to, you know, definitively say whether or not something works or not. Oh, oh, I agree because then it may even work for one group of people and not another. I, I know that because mm -hmm. I do all the dream experiments and some people it totally works for some people it doesn't. And you don't, yeah. you don't know why, you know, it's, I believe a lot of that has to do with people have to go in with some sense of believing it could work. So they're not like blocking off mm -hmm. this energy that comes through. Cause I, I believe we can block our own energy for sure. You oh, know, absolutely. Uh, ultra terrestrials and extraterrestrials. Okay. So yes. you're the first person to ever mention ultra terrestrials. And I knew what they, I had to look it up and find out what they were, but do you think that, um, it, maybe it's possible that we could use these boards to speak with any of them? Sure. Why not? Uh, th there's a lot of theories out there that extraterrestrials and ultra terrestrials are able to work on the same kind of plane as that, that spirits are on. Um, which would which would be a dimension above where where we're at, so there's no reason that they can't do that. Now, I mean, I've people have, including me and Tanya, we've used the Estes method to try to contact and have had success with that. Uh, the Spirit Box was originally designed to contact extraterrestrials, not ghosts. Well, interesting. Um, so there's really no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that with. In fact, it's something that now I kind of want to try. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> might as well try. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I have the perfect board for it, too. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, the Necronomicon board. So H.P. Oh. Lovecraft, his uh, Cthulhu mythos. Uh, yeah. So that would be a good board to try to contact aliens. Yeah. Oh, you have so many experiments you could do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, okay. So you don't think that like, if somebody owns like a, a Ouija board, cause you know, like I go to antique stores and I buy things all the time just for the house and stuff. And it seems like the, they say that, you know, dolls or anything can hold the energy of the people who owned it. So if you've mm -hmm. got a Ouija board, say you pick one up in an antique store from the 1950s and someone used it, you know, for 50 years, 
Do you think that their energy is imprinted in there and somehow maybe either they could come back and talk to you or whoever they were communicating with is still there? It It's certainly a possibility. I, I would say that it, that's unlikely unless they were somebody who used their Ouija board quite often. Uh, if it's something they only used once or once in a once in a blue moon, um, probably don't have too much energy attached to it. But if, if they were somebody who used it somewhat religiously, which happened a lot, you know, with all the different resurgences in spiritualism and, and, and that kind of thing, uh, people would use it as kind of a, a social thing. You know, that would mm -hmm. be their party. They'd come over for dinner, yeah. have some few drinks, and then it was a seance or table tipping or Ouija board. And so these things got used quite often during that time. So if if somebody did do that, then it's certainly possible that their energy kind of got attached to it. Yeah, because like you say, you do have one that's behind glass. So mm -hmm. you, well, you kept so, it there. So that's more that's more to protect the board then okay. protect people from the board. Because okay. I, I figure if, you know, I have the whole story written up for that one, uh, people are going to see it and they're going to want to touch the board. Which, <laughs> if it's one person here or there, that's fine. But, you know, if we're going to be traveling around with this museum, there's going to be tons of people who want to touch it and it could potentially damage the board. Sure. So it's, it's behind glass more to protect it than... In fact, I have some of my older boards are behind glass purely just to protect it because they're older boards. Yeah. Well, and that was a question I was going to ask you, like, how do you take care of, say, a board that's over 100 years old? Do you have to, like, maintain them in some way so they don't, you know, become a thing dust <laughs> after a while? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You got to kind of keep them clean. Um, you, they should be re-oiled. Uh, a, great, a, a great source to find out how to take care of them is actually the box that these boards came in. Oh. So from the 1890s all the way up through the 1880s, 1880s, 1980s, uh, the directions that were written on the, the, the box for how to use it were very, oh. very simple. Uh, basically said, you know, you sit with two people, knees together, board straddling. Uh, huh. It kind of talked you through how to ask questions, giving time in between questions, uh, waiting one to five minutes before you even ask questions giving the, oh. the, the planchette a chance to move. Uh, there's a disclaimer in there that, you know, they can't guarantee that anything is going to happen because, you know, it's up to the spirits. But then the last two rules are how to take care of the planchette and the board. Huh. That's now, cool. they, they stopped doing that in the 1980s um, with the onset of the satanic panic. They started coming up with all these other rules. Uh, and then the Internet took those and ran with them and added even more rules, most of which are complete nonsense. In fact, this whole section right here is all, it's a little washed out, but it's myth and superstition. So I actually have the Zozo demon, the satanic panic, and all the different uh, myths and so supposed rules and why a lot of them are nonsense and what really the best way to handle a Ouija board are, in our opinion. Okay. So that pretty much came about in the 1980s where everybody, so before that people were using them, it was just a fun thing. Nobody was going home thinking that demons were gonna get them. That came about in the 1980s pretty much. It started in the 70s. Um, you have things like in 1968, you had Rosemary's Baby. Then in 73, yeah. you had The Exorcist. And then in 76, The Omen. Uh, so you have these horror movies starting to plant this, this idea in people's minds. And then in 1980, a book came out called Michelle Remembers. And the book is about um, repressed memories that were brought back through hypnosis. Uh, and the memories are of being abducted by a satanic cult and all this ritual abuse that was done to her. Uh, and that, that book right there was really popular. And that really kicked off the whole satanic panic, uh, which there was some, something like 12,000 unsubstantiated claims of ritual abuse and satanic allegations and the vast majority of which like, there's no evidence for this whatsoever it was just mass hysteria yeah and and yeah. it it was <clears throat> it was bad for a lot of things you know a lot of music you know that heavy metal music got uh, really bad reputations because of that. Yeah. The Ouija board got bad reputations because of it. Horror movies got bad reputations because of it. Ghost hunting in general took a huge hit in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And it really wasn't until 
shows like Ghost Hunters and, and Ghost Adventures and, and whatnot that came on that kind of started to turn that narrative a bit. I agree. Yeah. I, up until those shows came about, I didn't even know, like pretty much when people even shared paranormal experiences, it was kind of like with certain friends yeah. at home. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't yeah, the ones public. that you trusted, the ones that weren't going to judge you too hard. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Somebody, maybe they had a story too. So you're kind of swapping stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is I'm, you know, I'm an engineer, so I work with a bunch of other engineers and when I started being more open about being into the paranormal and, and doing ghost hunting and all that, uh, a lot of them, when other engineers were around, would, would laugh at me, make fun of me a little bit. But then when it was just me and them alone in the hallway, it's like, hey, yeah. by the way, I got to tell you this story. And oh. they would tell me about their paranormal experiences. Every single person had a paranormal experience. They didn't want to yeah. let anyone else know, but they knew I would have, wasn't going to judge them. So they would tell me. <laughs> God. <laughs> so I want to hear a little bit more about um, the museum. So you're going to be at, what's your first event you're going to be at again? Uh, so it's going to be, it's called Curiosities. It's a event mm -hmm. put on by the Wyman Valley Ghost Tours, which is in the scranton Wilkesbury area of Pennsylvania. Uh, and what they do, they, they do some ghost hunting events. They do fundraisers. Uh, they do uh, paranormal trips like to Salem, Gettysburg, um, and um, Sleepy Hollow, uh, but they also do uh, these arts and craft shows throughout the year, and okay. they're they're metaphysical, horror, and paranormal related. So this, these are the arts and craft shows you want to go to if you want um, uh, horror art, or you want some witchy stuff, or you know you want to buy some ghost hunting equipment or something. So it's really a great opportunity for us to present our museum at, at this yeah. event. And so <clears throat> the the people who run Wyoming Valley Ghost Tours are a good friend of mine. So I told them I want to bring the museum there. So they put us on the bill for it. And the Scranton Cultural Center is probably the most beautiful building in Scranton. It is a not only a theater, but it is a Masonic Lodge. Oh. And so the whole thing is stone and and concrete and and beautiful beautifully painted the the stonework's immaculate the place is absolutely gorgeous it's very haunted i've actually been able to do ghost hunts there uh mm -hmm. several times and they've led us into the masonic lodges to to hunt there as well and the place that our museum is going to be set up is in the masonic library on the second floor oh i love that oh it, it, it's a absolutely beautiful library it's the perfect backdrop for for our museum to be presented there yeah. and yeah it's going to be a lot of fun it's going to be uh originally what you see behind me is basically all we were going to bring i have six of these walls um oh wow and then when i found out that we were going to be in the library and there's going to be the, the big tables and all that in there like all right i can bring probably every board i have now so this next week is going to be a mad dash to finish up making little placards for every every board that I have that's not already on the wall behind me. And uh, yeah, so we'll have, I don't know if we'll bring every board, but we'll have at least 40 upwards of 50 or 55 boards with us. That's nice. I hope you guys work your way out west or at least as far as like say las vegas or something eventually and i notice there are a lot more conventions like that that are kind of a combination where it's it's horror and it's paranormal mm -hmm. and it's metaphysical they kind of are combining and you get much more of a large group and there's one out here called um oh gosh what's it called the mid midsummer scream and it's usually like in july and i mean it has it's huge it's it's i don't even know how many probably a million people go through it or something. I mean, it's, oh. it's amazingly large. <laughs> um, but uh, I know there's another one in Las Vegas and I know now there's an oddities uh, one that's traveling around the U S. So this mm. is really becoming a thing that people are really, really interested is. in. And I love the traveling museums because it's something that maybe you can't get out to where the person is at physically but you can, you happen to be going to convention and then you can go like, you'll be like a separate little thing that people can go in and see. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah, the most that's... part. Yeah. I, I, it, getting out West is definitely something that's on our list. I doubt we'll get to that this year. Um, yeah. Cause between ghost hunts and, and 
Tanya's got her two younger kids and well, not younger, they're teenagers, but they still need her around. And yeah. so getting out West this year is probably not going to happen, but it's definitely on our list of, of things that we want to do and, and kind of, because I know there's the Salem Witchboard Museum, which is in Salem, Massachusetts. There's uh, Jeff's um, tr Jeff's Traveling Wonder or Museum of Traveling Wonders, which is another traveling Ouija board museum. Uh, yeah. He does a lot. He's in Maine. He does a lot of stuff on the East Coast. He he has uh, ha he has become a good friend of mine. And then we're doing our thing. I'm not I'm not aware of any that are in the Midwest or out west. Yeah, uh, there might be that, but I'm just not aware of them. I know there's uh, some of the the experts on the Ouija board, which have been a huge source of knowledge in a lot of my research. Um, uh, some of them are out in Arizona, uh, oh. and New Mexico area. So there's definitely uh, people who know their stuff out there. Uh, but as far as I know, none of them have opened up museums. They got their stuff online, but no no place that you can just go and, and see that stuff. So, so yeah. hopefully we can get out there and and uh, have more people see what we have to show. Yeah. There's definitely something about seeing it in person as opposed mm -hmm. to just seeing it online. I mean, I, I seeing it online is great too, but to actually be, you know, in the presence of the boards and talk to, cause you guys are the museum curators. So you're mm -hmm. able to answer questions that people yep. don't know. And I'll be curious to know how many people ask you if they're evil. <laughs> cause uh, that I, was like one of my- I bet a bunch. I'm, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of people <laughs> asking those kind of questions, which is why we have a whole section of the museum dedicated to it. Um, yeah. Again, we have some stuff back here that you can't see, but we have a whole section on spiritualism. I mean, cause that's what gave rise to the Ouija boards to begin with. And right. so we have, you know, seances and scrying and table tipping and then get into the history of the board itself. And then all the different boards coming up all the way back around to the myth and superstition. And finally the, the legacy where we're nowadays the Ouija board is more than just a tool to talk to the dead. It's a whole aesthetic. So we have, yeah purses oh, yeah. and, and pillows and movies and a, I have a guitar that has a Ouija board on it so that's up going to be hanging there too and oh my god I love that <laughs> have you ever seen the movie Ouija I have yes yeah there, my there son are... got that at the Dollar Tree <laughs> I ended up watching it with him and I was like oh There's my god two or three sequels to that one I forget how many Is sequels there... yeah I haven't seen oh. the sequels yet but yeah, yeah, when I was for the, for part of the legacy, movies is part of that. And when I started looking up for uh, movies based on Ouija boards, it it numbered in the hundreds. I was like, okay, oh, about, I, I'm just going to narrow it down to to ones that have Ouija in the name. Well, even that, there was yeah. like 50 movies. So I just picked a wow. handful of them that were maybe a little bit more popular and threw those on the list. But what yeah, do you think is the best one? Like, what's what, a movie that's that you like that's about Ouija boards? Which board? Which board? So, yeah, so that came out in 1986. Um, a lot of the the uh, uh, quote unquote rules and, and things to be wary of with the Ouija board can actually uh, trace back their lineage to that movie. Like, um, oh. you know, the board, the planchette going in circles or figure eights, that being the sign of, of something evil coming through, which is nonsense it's just the spirits getting used to moving the thing uh oh. which is right in the literature of the original ouija boards yeah. but it being evil that first time that that kind of popped up was the movie witch board um oh. and not to use it by yourself that originated originated in the movie witch board uh <clears throat> so from that standpoint i really don't like it because it it added a lot of misinformation but it's a really good movie <laughs> Oh, I'm going to have to find it and watch it then. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I have, so the, the board that they used in which board I actually have, yeah. um, oh. it, I can't grab it cause it's attached to the wall, but it's on the, down there on the bottom. But yeah, I had that one. <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, then, so that's another thing. You have a website. So if somebody like sees the boards in the background, they want to see what they look like online, then they can go to your website. And like you said, you have most of them mm -hmm. on the website broken down with information. Yep. And, and there's, there'll be. I think I have four boards. I guess still got to add, and within the next couple of days, they'll they'll be put up. I just got to get the pictures of them and and sit down and put them up. Um, but yeah, and if anybody has any you know questions, they're more than welcome to reach out. I have a contact info on the on the website, and we also 
just you know, opened up a forum on the website. So if you want to go in and and start a conversation, you know, tell your Ouija board stories, or if you want to yeah. ask questions about Ouija boards, um, we're we're would love to collect stories that, that people have had. Maybe even um, if if they're interested, do a little bit of analysis on it based on what we know. Try to give some explanation, you know, if if we can. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, help out wherever we can. Oh, I absolutely love that. You 100% need to do that because I think people would really enjoy going on, especially I would enjoy it, going online and reading people's stories. I only have one when I was probably like 12. We used to always do slumber parties. And mm -hmm. so there was one week, I think I got in trouble or something and I wasn't allowed to go. And apparently that was the night that they did the Ouija board and everybody came to school on Monday. They were all complaining. They had nightmares, something weird happened. The lights flickered, like the whole, you know, grand story. And I remember being terrified, which maybe is part of the reason I've never used one up and, you know, still because of that story. It's in my like childhood, you know, subconscious mind that, that scares me, but I would love to go through and read the stories and see what the similarities are. And if there's anything different, you know? So, so one of the favorite stories that I've heard, uh, this, so this was told by a coworker of mine um, and it, it had to do with his kids. So when his, I think it was his daughter, um, when she was a, a younger teenager, she had some friends over, they decided to use the Ouija board and he found out about it. So he decided to go down in the basement and start flickering the power to her room on and off. <laughs> Um, he, he, he made some ghostly noises outside the door and, and scared the hell out of those kids. So, so it, it makes you wonder, you know, people who have had odd experiences with the Ouija board where they, where the lights are flickering or that you hear a couple weird noises. Are you sure it wasn't your parents screwing with you? Cause I know my parents would have screwed with me. Yeah. I also know me and Tanya would screw with her kids. Yeah. It would be too tempting not to, right? I, yeah. You got to. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. So is there anything that um, you want to put out there about your museum or Ouija boards in general that you want to share before we close? Uh, the, the, the main thing that I want to put out there, um, other than, you know, find us on Facebook under Empty Casket Paranormal, Instagram, Empty Casket Paranormal, and our website, uh, we have EmptyCasketParanormal.com and ectalkingboardmuseum.com. Um, Aside from all that, uh, Ouija boards are not evil. They are a tool to speak with the dead. Using one, yes, it opens up a door of communication, but that's it's the same door of communication that you open when you use dowsing rods, pendulums, a DR60, REM pods, or even when you go to a cemetery, sit down and talk to a deceased loved one. You're opening that same door. Just say thank you and goodbye at the end, and it's over. I love that. I never even considered about, yeah, you go to a cemetery and you're talking to a loved one, even just talking to a loved one or praying or making offerings. All of these mm -hmm. things are opening a line of communication with something that we don't necessarily see. Yeah. yeah the, the only difference is using something like a pendulum, dowsing rods, DR60, Ouija board. They're giving the spirits or deity or whoever it is you're talking to, whatever it is you're talking to, a chance to talk back. Yeah. And, yeah. And yeah, that can be scary, but it's not in and of itself a bad thing. Sure, something less friendly can come through, but even then, it's just because it's not friendly doesn't mean it's evil. You know, right. I, I'm sure you've experienced angry ghosts or, or spirits that just like to screw with people. Yeah. Again, I'd, I, yeah. I, I know that when I die, if I come back as a ghost, I'm going to screw with ghost hunters. I know I'm going to do that. <laughs> it's too tempting not it, to. It, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I screw with ghost hunters when I'm ghost hunting. Not, <laughs> not on paid events or anything like that. But if I'm just out with friends and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, you, you're probably going to get scared at some point, And it's probably going to be my fault. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes on purpose. Sometimes on accident. Sorry, Rob. I know I've scared you a bunch of times. Most of it's not been on purpose. <laughs> Thank you for watching this episode of Haunted Hour Podcast. I put links below on where you can find Bill, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.